Welcome to our Women Leading Tech Series, sally Ann. It could not be a Women Leading Tech Series in Australia without the maven, guru, <laughs> matriarch that is yourself. So if you look back to your 10-year-old self, when was it really that you fell in love with STEM? There's a couple of things that stand out in my life as a moment of a love for STEM, and I don't think I knew it was STEM, and I certainly didn't know it was technology or computer science. It was the realisation that technology and science can actually solve some of the world's most fundamental problems, and it's actually at the heart of creation and invention, and that's something that I've fallen in love with the problem, and I've fallen in love with being a problem solver, and for me that is something that's really exciting. The computer side of things was when I had to buy my first computer to write my thesis, so nothing very technical about that. Uh, but I did ask a good friend of mine who was a computer scientist to take me shopping and help me so that I didn't get ripped off. And um, she made me build my first computer, which kind of opened my eyes to the possibilities. I just didn't know that that was something that you could even be possible. So I've, I've, honestly, my career is not planned out. It is completely stumbled upon by accident and just saying yes to opportunities that have come my way and being very, very curious along the whole journey and um, passionate, becoming a passionate, passionate problem solver. How does one leave a company like Google and take a leap into something like Cicada Innovations? I never actually went and knocked on any doors to thinking, in thinking about what was next for me after, after my career at Google um, or towards that, the end of what I thought my time was there. Um, Cicada came to me. And I think what attracts me to it is the purpose. I'm not getting out of bed doing tech for tech's sake. I'm, I'm getting out of bed and I'm serving the founders in our community. I'm serving the venture capitalists and the investors that come around. I'm serving industry partners. I'm serving government. I really get the opportunity to serve something that is bigger uh, than building a piece of technology which makes my life easier and it's convenient and it's great, but it's not just about consuming technology, it's actually fundamentally supporting companies that are going to have a, a positive impact. What do you think some of the biggest hurdles are to women in tech? I think the barriers on the journey, um, they're quite significant, right? For me, I don't think I realised that gender was a challenge that was holding me back until I started re reaching more senior levels and the level of cultural misogyny that exists in Australia really became apparent to me uh, and the glass ceiling and the lack of network that I had and the fact that I wouldn't get invited to things and the assumptions that people had around me, mm -hmm. that I was from HR or I was from marketing. And look, I, I love people that are from HR and marketing, but it's not a skill set that I have. So not being recognised for that and having to deal with those assumptions was a really interesting thing to sort of deal with on a daily basis. But I would say the biggest barrier that I have is probably the way that we actually raise women and girls in Australia is with a lot of self-doubt at least for me, uh, and my own sort of self-esteem and my own sort of personal insecurities. I've never seen myself as somebody capable or confident of, of so many things. And so to actually have people believe in me and give me opportunity and extend me beyond what I was comfortable with or thought I was capable of has been an absolute helping hand to, to help me realise that actually there is probably, I, I probably can do more than what I think I can. What is deep tech? Deep tech is fundamentally using science and engineering to solve really complex problems in the world. And where I differentiate it from general tech is it's generally solving things that you don't necessarily as a consumer touch, see or feel. So we think about general tech, we think about computers, devices, stuff that we would interact with. Deep tech is the things that's curing cancer that is solving um, you know, clean and green energy, that is working on soil sustainability or waste in agriculture and, and, and farming and turning that into enriched fodder. So it's really about science and engineering solving some of the fundamental challenges that we face in, in all of those areas and bringing those solutions to market through building a business. What hurdles do you see for Australia in the deep tech space, but also what opportunities are sort of glaringly yeah. obvious for you? Yeah, so I think the hurdles uh, always will be sort of similar. You know, it's we are a small market, so you have to be global from day one and you have to bring in capital from overseas. Early stage investment and patient capital in this space is still really nascent and it's still really hard. We have seen really great advancements. You know, Main Sequence Ventures has done a phenomenal job in the last few years of, of starting to turn the tables and we've got more deep tech investment and interest from the venture capital community than ever before, but we can do more. 
policy levers need to be long term and shift, we're not going far enough. Government has an incredible opportunity to set the next 20 to 30 years of scientific and engineering discovery and economic growth in this country by putting some lines in the sand and creating some sort of not, not moon shots, but Mars shots and really going, this is what we're going to do and understanding that the economic benefit that flows from that is for generations and it's it's wealth creating, it's good for people. So I think I think those things can be overcome in and business needs to invest and, and come alongside it as well. The opportunities for me are absolutely so obvious. One of the, the amazing things that we have in Australia is incredibly intelligent, well-trained researchers and people, and we need to find a way to unleash them. And unleash them in a not an academic context, but actually in a translational and commercialisational uh, context and give them opportunity. So, you know, I think if we can pull them out of universities, if we can put them into sort of some of the companies I see here, that's where we see those growth opportunities and we see a reinvestment into the ecosystem. We have opportunities in health. We are world leaders in, in health and have been for years. So what else can we do in that space? Um, not just around uh, diagnostics, but the therapeutic space. We've got incredible capacity and capability. Uh, how do we bring in more manufacturing onshore? We actually do have contract manufacturing onshore, but we could do more and we can make it much more connected. Agriculture, the intersection between agriculture and health for me is super exciting. And then you get space agriculture and health and the intersection between all three is an amazing place to be. You can be a company that actually services all three of those sectors if you have the right tech and the right opportunity. So yeah, if it's a global problem, let's go after it because the large addressable market is there and let's be really serious about solving it and commercializing those things and making those assets live in Australia. So deep tech in Australia. Is it an advantage for a country as small and isolated as ours to actually have this here? Or are there major hurdles for the fact that we are in, you know, as far away as you can be probably from New York City? It's a really great question and there isn't an easy answer to it. Countries that are the same size as us, so or, or similar size in terms of GDP, so um, you see far more R&D companies. So if I think about Canada and South Korea, they have in the 60, 60, I think it's 62, 63 um, of the world sort of global leaders, top 2,500 R&D companies are in, in Canada and, and another 40 or so in South Korea, or maybe the other way around. Australia's got 14. So if we look at com comparable economies, we absolutely have no reason that we can't be doing far more than what we do. Mm -hmm. So we have the capabilities, we have the talents, we have an incredible university system here. We have great creative people. What I think we have is a lack of focus and a lack of focus both by government and also by industry and a commitment to a long-term vision to do this. There is absolutely no reason that we can't be deep tech leaders but we need to actually have an aligned commitment from industry, from government and from the community and a really solid long-term vision about why this matters. And it matters, it matters fundamentally for prosperity reasons, right? Our economic prosperity depends on it. And it also, you know, not just that, but it actually is a game changer for bringing solutions to market and solutions to market that are good for people and they're good for the planet. It's not an either or, and it's not a mutually exclusive. Australia's are really, really good at actually being adopters of, of, of technology and consuming it. We love it. We're, we're really great early test pay, beds for things like that. But why should we limit ourselves to that? Why shouldn't we actually be exporting that globally from day one and actually you know, seeing that impact globally as well? What role does deep tech have to play in the fight against the climate emergency? in every one of those areas, right? So climate emergency, so many people focus in one part of it. They focus on just energy and renewables, but it's actually in soil degradation, it's in farming, it's in water, it's in oceans, it's in lakes, it's in rivers. Every single thing that we do in production of housing, in production of food, uh, in production of fibres and textiles and clothing, every single one of those has an impact on people and planet, either positive or negative. And I think there's an opportunity to actually rethink all of those. For me, where I see the greatest opportunity is looking at how do we use synthetic biology across every sector? Not just lab grown meats, that's fine, that's interesting, but actually, can we actually lab grow leather? Well, yes, we can. Milo exists and Bolt Threads and the work that they do. Can we lab grow bricks? 
you know, can you actually make bricks from maybe mushroom um, versus cement and using a scarce resource of sand, which is a scarce resource because not all sand is able to be used in cement. You know, how do we rethink some of the fundamental building blocks of society, literally building blocks, and actually produce them in a sustainable way that is good for planet and, and does no harm, but maybe even perhaps captures and is carbon, not just carbon neutral, but carbon negative. Um, there's a great company I've just worked with uh, recently through in the Startmate program called Ulu. And what I love about what they're doing is they're producing polymers from seaweed. And that polymer is 100% biodegradable. It's a marine born polymer. And they don't want to just do rigid, replace rigid plastics. They want to replace it in textiles in, in every possible way and place. Those kinds of things, those kinds of companies, those kinds of opportunities are ones that we absolutely have to go after and support and throw all of our weight and resources behind. Looking back across your journey, who have been the biggest champions for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm really fortunate. I've had some amazing men and women in my life who've believed in me. Probably the biggest one was my last, um, my last two bosses at Google, Alan Noble, and I will give a shout out to him because he's a pretty special individual. But he said, you need to come and help me build this part of the business and do all of these things. And I never once questioned whether I could or not, because he gave me permission to try and to fail. And I think that's a really important thing to do and to model for people, giving them space and accountability to learn and grow. My mentor, Maggie Johnson, was a phenomenal leader and, and an inspiration to me and still is. I'm fortunate that my chair of my board believes in me more than I believe in myself here as well, which is great. You know, that's what it should be. Um, but I, I'm surrounded by an amazing network of women, right? You learn to live with self-doubt and I don't think you ever eradicate it, but you learn not to listen to it. And you learn to listen to the other people around you that say, go for it, give it a shot. What's the worst that could happen? And so those people and those enabling people, I think that's something that we have to seek to do mm -hmm. as a community and for women to lift other women up, but also men to do the same thing. And so always give those opportunities. I want to give those opportunities to my team and to people underneath me. I don't want to be the one that's in the spotlight and doing those things. I need to be an enabler of them. Mm. We need to have women on government boards, but we actually also need to have women in tech on government boards. Can you walk us through a bit about that side of your portfolio career? Yeah, so for me, I am actually being very intentional about the things that I spend my time on. And there's quite a number of committees and things that I'm on that I can't I don't actually talk about. They are, you know, in grants and other sort of decision making places, but I deliberately choose to do that and choose to engage behind closed doors in advocacy because it's really important to have critical conversations and not always do them in, in public because you do need to talk about difficult things. And so I will happily spend, you know, all of my hours doing those things if it actually helps to influence policy and direction in the right way. I choose to take on things where I feel like I can contribute. So I will never take a board or an advisory role where it's about um, me or my profile, but it's always about can I help make transformational change in this organisation? Is there some skill set that I can bring to the table and are they on that journey that they want to engage in that transformation? For me, I'm really transparent. When you go through that interview process on the board, it's a, it's a two-way interview. You only actually get to great decisions and outcomes if you have diversity in the boardroom and in the leadership tables. And that's not just gender diversity, that's life experience diversity, that is every, po it's age, it's technology, and we need more people that actually deeply understand technology and not just from a use case perspective, but how are we building it and how are we thinking about it to actually sit there. Banking is a, a really great example of this right now. And, and we need to be having a conversation about ethical AI and banking. If you looked at Australia's banking data sets, right? If you have data of 100 years, what does that data tell you? What would that story tell you in Australia? Well, it would tell you that women couldn't actually have a home loan in their own name until the 80s. It would tell you that they couldn't get a credit card. It would tell you that if they were married, they couldn't even have their own bank account. And if you're Indigenous, you know, the levels of, of, of storytelling and narrative there are even worse, you know? So it actually Actually, if you use that data without context in artificial intelligence, it's going to bias decisions and outcomes about lending, about all sorts of things in favour of white men. And that's something that we need to be aware of. You know, those cultural sort of decisions in the past around those things, we've changed and we've moved on from there. But we, we have to understand that 
AI can't actually understand that without context and without context setting. And so how do we think about designing products that actually do good and don't do harm? And, and you have to keep thinking about it. You can't think about it once. You have to think about it again and again and again. So it's, it's, these are really complex things to grapple with. And we need people that deeply and fundamentally understand not just AI, but actually how to build products and services and what the unintended consequences are. And I have to have lived through a few of them to know what that's going to be. And we don't have enough of those people sitting around boardroom tables in Australia right now. So in the fight for diversity in tech, who's actually leading and who should be? It's everybody's responsibility. But unfortunately, I think that whenever you get into a diversity conversation, the people that are leading the conversation and leading the work are the underrepresented people that are trying to make the change. So if we talk about women, it's women. If we talk about uh, Indigenous or First Nations people, it's First Nations people in every country. It's always the underrepresented that are having to put their shoulder to the plough, so to speak. It's a bit annoying, isn't it? It's not a bit annoying. It's absolutely, it's absolutely infuriating. Yes. I'm trying to sort of maybe not get too angry about it. I think it's absolutely unacceptable. And for me, I, come, I guess this comes back to what's in my sphere of influence and what's in my sphere of control. And so where I can control it, I make an impact and I will draw the line in the sand on things as much as I possibly can and hold the ground on that. And where I can influence, I will actually not only influence, but if somebody says to me, yes, I want to do that and I, I get it, I will go and walk the journey alongside of them. So I can give you a live example of this. On International Women's Day here, we didn't want to just have morning tea with our women. We actually wanted to create a connection. So yep, we did have our cakes and we did have our pastries and it was good. But we got angry together and we got frustrated together and we connected and we talked about what mattered to us. And to the credit of this community, this incredible community of people that I have here, there was quite a lot of men that came to that and said, is it okay for us to come? I was like, absolutely, we want you to be there. And they listened and they heard. And I had two, I had a founder that came to me afterwards with one of his senior leaders and said, we're not where we wanna be. I heard you, I heard you, I wanna be different. I don't know where to start, will you help me? And I said, will you be willing to be made accountable to me? if I give you my help? And he was like, yes. And they're on that journey right now. And they have made, in, in just a few months, they have made a commitment to their entire team about what they are doing to change their leadership ratio. They are changing the structure of their board and who is going to be on their board. They are thinking about their next hires and they are being strategic and intentional in every single decision. And the best thing that they said to me this week about this is, you know, we, we want to get experts to come in and help us. So we're happy to consult with, you know, D&I people and maybe bring somebody on the team at some point. But we heard you loud and clear. It's our KPIs. It's, our, it's on us to deliver on this as leaders and managers. And it's our ownership of this. It's not somebody that we're going to bring in to say, please fix us. And that just made me so happy. In the context of Cicada going forwards, what's your dream? What do you want to achieve while you're here? Oh, wow. Look, my dream, I have two dreams. I have one for Australia and I have one for Cicada Innovations. And I think they're uniquely tied together. My dream would be to actually see Australia become a really complex economy with hundreds and hundreds of R&D businesses solving the world's most pressing problems through science and engineering, and actually you know, having a positive impact on people, planet, and prosperity, and not just in Australia, but globally. And I think Cicada Innovations is an amazing place to do that. Right now, we've got 44 resident businesses here employing 450 people. And for me, those companies, I want them to be household names. I want them to be things that Australians can look to, be proud of and engage in and see as a future economic opportunity that they can participate in and they can build businesses just like that. Mm -hmm.